Well, hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. It is my absolute pleasure um, to welcome you to this session today called End Inequalities, End AIDS, End Pandemics. Um, I am your moderator for today. I'm Peter Hayward, editor of The Lancet HIV, a journal dedicated to publishing research and opinions to advance the HIV field. And it's really my great pleasure honor, and honor to have been invited um, by the hosts of today's session to moderate. Um, the hosts of the session today are Caprisa and the Chinese CDC. Um, and they've really uh, put together a fantastic, uh, fantastic set of speakers who are going to talk to you today about HIV, um, reflecting where we are in the fight against HIV today. Um, you know, the past four decades reflecting on that and reflecting on the future. Um, and also, obviously, we'll be reflecting on the past couple of years as well um, and the impact that uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 have had and the interplay between HIV, AIDS and, and this new pandemic. Um, as I said, we've got a fantastic list of speakers today. We're going to hear from Adiba Kamaral Zaman, Peter Piot, George Gao, John and Kenga Song, Song uh, Sibongile Chabalala, and also um, from Professor Salim Karim. Um, before we get starting, before we start uh, with the speakers, before I introduce the first speaker, I um, we are recording the session today. So if uh, if you know any of your colleagues can't make it, uh, you can always tell them to check it out later. It will be aired on the Caprisa YouTube channel. Um, and we'd really like for everyone who's watching today to get involved. You can use the uh, chat and comment functions to uh, to share your thoughts on the speaks on the on the speakers' talks as they're happening. And also, we'd really welcome any questions that you might have for our speakers. So please use the Q and A function, and we will have a moderated a, a question and answer uh, session at the end of the talks. So now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is uh, Professor Adiba Kamaral Zaman, uh, Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at the University of Malaya, um, Chairwoman of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation and President of the International AIDS Society. Adiba is going to be talking to us uh, on HIV, Follow the Science. Um, so let's hand over to Adiba and see what she has to say. Good evening and thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the World AIDS Day webinar today. Um, my name is Adiba Kamarul Zaman. I'm from the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and president of the International AIDS Society. I'll be speaking this evening on HIV, follow the signs. From the release of the viral genome, in January 2020, to modeling the non-pharmaceutical interventions and restrictions that impact national policies, to finding effective treatment for severe disease, and more recently, um, repurposed drugs and novel treatment for acute and early infections, we have witnessed the amazing power of science to turn around the COVID-19 pandemic that has wrecked, that has wreaked havoc across the world. And of course, it has been a dizzy year for vaccine science that has resulted in some taming of the pandemic, although we still are not out of the woods yet. Certainly in Malaysia, where we witnessed a horrific surge of the Delta infection between July and September of this year, it was only upon the arrival of the vaccine and scale up that uh, once it surpassed 50% of the population, it's now at about 90% of the population, did we finally manage to get some relief from the horrific scenes that we were witnessing in our emergency departments, in the COVID wards, and in um, intensive care units all over the country. 
it was on the back of this amazing scientific endeavor and achievements for the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 pandemic that the IES decided to put out a clarion call in our annual letter to follow the signs in this, what Croatia very nicely put as a hundred last hundred miles to end the um, AIDS pandemic in a recent meeting that we both attended for you and AIDS. As we saw in the several decades of um, the HIV pandemic, the know your epidemic, know your response that became the mantra for the HIV response continues to be an important um, uh, strategy for responding to pandemics, whether it's HIV or COVID-19 response. And we have seen the world over that knowing your pandemic and following the signs can give rise to great outcomes, whether it's in COVID or in HIV. Now, here's an example of uh, where nations understand the nature of their pandemic. Uh, in this instance, um, in Ukraine, China, and in Malaysia, where we were witnessing increases in um, HIV incidents due to um, injecting drug use, the implementation of harm reduction resulted in the reversal of the pandemic in Ukraine, in China, and in Malaysia. The opposite would happen if uh, these evidence-based intervention programs are not implemented, as has been seen in the Philippines and in um, countries uh, from the former Soviet Union. Following the signs not only saves lives, but it also saves money. As you can see from this slide, the evaluation that we carried out on the harm reduction in pro of the harm reduction program in Malaysia saw savings of millions of ringgit in health, in direct healthcare costs for the Malaysian government. But we need continued investment in new tools and invest in research and, and continue to invest in research and development in HIV if we are, are going to bring an end to AIDS. There's been no doubt a disappointing setback from recent advances in HIV vaccine research. But we look forward to results of Mosaico with anticipation and further um, trials in regards to HIV vaccine technology. New tools such as um, the discovery of new broadly neutralizing antibodies for the HIV prevention is now in very active field of research with at least 11 studies underway, most still in phase one, but there are two in phase two. And once again, we look forward to much development in this exciting field. Advances in treatment have also seen simplification of treatment regime from single pill doses to two drug regime for treatment and dose simplification. This have no doubt led to better quality of life for our patients living with HIV. More recently, research in long acting injectables or pills continue, will continue to improve the treatment landscape for people, for people living with HIV and perhaps be a game changer in how we manage patients with this chronic disease. Certainly, we must continue to invest in cure research, but um, a little worrying is that we have seen a plateauing in funding related to this um, research program. As you can see, HIV science has remained active despite um, the attention that rightly so has been given to COVID research and we must continue to find new ways to implement the tools that we already have 
from, um, like I mentioned, needle syringe program, which remains and, and uh, opiate agonist treatment that needs to be scaled up. But we also have a not so new tool in the form of PrEP that um, is entering its second decade. Although the uptake of PrEP um, has been rather slow since the, um, you know, since the clinical trials confirming the effectiveness of PrEP, fortunately in the last few years, we're seeing more and more countries adopting this effective prevention tool. However, I think it remains to be seen, although adopted into national policies, whether PrEP will be um, scale up to um, scaled up effectively to bring about a uh, reduction in new HIV cases around the world. A fine example of PrEP scale up has been in Australia. In 2016, uh, before 2016, the uh, remarkable HIV response that we've seen in Australia for decades saw a plateauing of new cases of HIV in, in that country. However, with a concerted effort to scale up PrEP, which initially began as a large implementation science program in 2018, which then be, uh, was absorbed into a national program the Australians have now seen the, the fruits of their success with a sharp decline in the number of new HIV diagnoses in Australian-born MSM, factored at 42% decline and a 75% decline in Australian-born men living in the inner city. In the setting of affordable PrEP that is now being rolled out in Australia, with associated healthcare services, Australia has witnessed very low HIV incidence of one to two per thousand person years amongst gay and bisexual men who were previously at high risk. Now, what has Australia done right that has not been seen in many other countries around the world? I think one of the um, defining features of the Australian response right from the beginning is its high level political support and targeted response to HIV together with a highly functional primary care system or universal health care. And in the case of PrEP being offered at a relatively low cost, but with the provision of generic PrEP coupled with quality monitoring and evaluation and timely data, and importantly, the involvement of people living with HIV and people affected by HIV, um, and by and large, the very HIV literate and mobilized gay community. So ladies and gentlemen, in the last 20 years, we have witnessed the power of signs. We have witnessed, although the COVID pandemic is far from over, we have now an amazing array of diagnostic tools. We have effective treatment for severe disease and promising treatment for early disease, not to mention, of course, the vaccines. Over the last four decades, we have also witnessed how HIV has become a disease that killed more than 36 million people to a chronic manageable condition and a highly preventable disease. Our challenge is to implement these evidence-based tools for both prevention and treatment that we already have to scale. As we have witnessed time and again, it takes a lot of science, but it also means dealing with politics, ideology, and sometimes plain ignorance as was said by Ken Buse and, Michael C and Michelle Sidibe and Claire Dickinson in a paper back in 2008 when they were discussing the know your epidemic, know your response um, strategy. HIV response works best when we all come together, clinicians, scientists, researchers, community 
workers, people living with HIV and affected by HIV, and of course, policymakers and funders. Let's be encouraged and inspired by COVID signs to push the extra few hundred miles to end AIDS by following and expanding the signs that we have all built together over the last four decades. Thank you. Well, that was just a fantastic uh, global overview of where we are uh, with HIV science at the moment and uh, how tying together sort of the many different aspects of, of the HIV response can make a real difference where there is uh, where there's political will to follow the science and, and drive to do so. Thank you so much, Adiba, for that fantastic opening talk. It now is my uh, great pleasure to hand over to uh, Peter Peel. Uh, Peter is the Handa Professor of Global Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a special advisor to the European Commission on Research Innovation for COVID-19. And his work uh, from dis the discovery of, of Ebola in the 70s to work over the past four decades on HIV really is, uh, is testament to his drive um, and you know, many wonderful achievements. So, as I say, it's an absolute delight to, uh, to welcome Peter's discussion on AIDS from epidemic to endemic, the importance of a long-term perspective. Let's hear what Peter's got to say on that. Hello, everybody. There's no doubt that we've come a long, long way. Um, when it comes to um, the response to AIDS. And it's always good to, uh, to remind us in, when we are struggling with uh, all the difficult issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, the question, of course, is where we're going. And here you can see uh, the evolution since 2000, but uh, let's not forget that this epidemic has been with us for at least 40 years when AIDS was uh, described for the first time. Um, and, um, you know, it is uh, less uh, acute in most populations than before, but also uh, the progress that was quite spectacular in the, uh, you know, the 2000s and particularly since the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, that uh, progress has really slowed down. And um, this, it's very clear that we will not reach the UN goals, um, and that was already the case before uh, COVID hit us and made it even worse. And it, it is so that, um, you know, despite all this effort, when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, that um, uh, HIV AIDS is uh, still the uh, main cause of death. So it's not that it's marginalized, even if it's off uh, the headlines, and uh, we're going to a situation where, um, you know, where there is um, increasing uh, heterogeneity uh, in terms of uh, among countries. Some countries are far more affected, I'm thinking particularly in Southern Africa, but also like um, some of the former Soviet uh, republics. Um, and then of course, within countries, certain populations. Um, and here you can see uh, quite a big difference between uh, when you look at just Sub-Saharan Africa, which by the way, is definitely not a, a homogeneous type of uh, continent in general, but also when it comes to AIDS and the rest of the world, who is uh, becoming infected? And there's a huge difference. Sub-Saharan Africa, it is mostly, uh, you know, young women, young men also. Um, and whereas in the rest of the world, um, you know, it is very specific populations, men who sex with men, uh, drug users, uh, etc. And so we are uh, coming in a situation where uh, not unsimilar, uh, dissimilar when we talk about COVID, where uh, rather than to talk about the end of AIDS, as is still the official uh, rhetoric, and with even a date on it, and, and I think we have to start thinking what to explain and what to do when we don't reach that. But it's like with COVID, um, we have to set aside and you know, zero COVID, and we have to think about living with HIV as societies. Of course, we have people living with HIV, and uh, 30 
plus million and they know what this is all about. But as societies also, we have to do it. And when you look at the, the whole picture, and this is one indicator of it, um, AIDS is off the front page. Um, and, uh, and that's reflected in many, many uh, aspects, uh, including uh, funding. This is from the IHME latest update on the national funding for AIDS, but national funding has uh, collapsed even more uh, than that. So the, um, the, the future really um, will depend on a few things. One, of course, we had the great disruption, uh, which is still going on in terms of COVID-19 and which has negatively impacted um, the uh, care for people living with HIV because of supply issues, also prevention programs, even research, uh, clinical trials, just name it. It's of course not specific for, for HIV, but it is a, a, a real effect of life. But the future um, will defend, depend on many, many aspects, the future of AIDS. Um, it's of course on whether this kind of uh, disruption will continue and there will be others coming, which is quite likely, but it depends on the virus. Will the virus develop resistance on people's behavior, technologies, um, you know, leadership and politics, prosperity in general, um, demographics, et cetera, et cetera. And um, about uh, 15 years ago, I uh, launched a project when I was head of UNAIDS that was, uh, you know, about uh, AIDS in Africa, the long-term future. We were looking at 2025, so that's around the corner. And because I felt that we need this long-term view um, because it's important that decisions we take today, even in the midst of a crisis, that at least we have some idea and some vision on what the longer term implications are. And at the end of the day, again, uh, we want a long term, a sustainable response that benefits um, people and saves as many lives as possible, not just in the, in the you know, what's going on today. And then also um, about, uh, well, uh, 12, 13 years ago, I launched a so-called AIDS 2031 consortium um, and uh, uh, that issued a report, AIDS taking a long-term view for the same reasons, trying to look into the future um, and uh, to see what is feasible, what is, uh, you know, what should we do, where should we invent, invest and so on. Next, so the long-term view is not something new, but I think now we have to make sure that uh, it is on the agenda as much as managing a crisis. When this came up, uh, some activists accused me of wanting to uh, defer um, much needed, uh, you know, uh, measures uh, immediately. Um, but that, of course, is, can never be the, uh, the reason. We have to make sure that this benefits the most people possible all over the world, including the most marginal ones. And the... Um, the long term uh, is, is really already getting clearer and clearer in the sense that we've moved from an epidemic to an endemic. Again, a bit of deja vu when uh, we think of where we're going with, the, with COVID and with coronaviruses in general. And these are some quotes from the, um, you know, these two reports I mentioned. Uh, and in 2005, uh, the report on AIDS in Africa, which involved uh, well over 100 people from Africa involved in, uh, in the AIDS response. Um, and it said AIDS is not a short-term problem, whatever is done today. The decisions not taken now will shape the future history of AIDS. So that's the reason why we have to think of that. And then the AIDS 2031 report, which came out in 2011, said also pandemic is not going away, but its magnitude and severity can be dramatically curtailed. We need to adopt a long-term perspective and recognize the pandemic for the generation-long challenge that it is. So we're in this for the long haul, and that is now clear. Um, and that has many, many uh, implications, and many implications organizationally, um, etc. Uh, but besides the negative disruptions that I mentioned, I mean, COVID, but also a decline in leadership, etc., and because COVID has not only affected operations, but also, for example, when you hear UNAIDS, they mostly talk about COVID, not about AIDS. So it's a leadership issue and impact of COVID. But there are, um, you know, uh, in terms of the 
uh, the future and in order to do better um, on the one hand sounds boring but we need to do a lot more of the same it's not that we have to throw away what we've been doing we need a lot more of the same prevention programs combination prevention uh, uh, ensuring long-term care and uh, therapy for people living with hiv fighting resistance which um, disappointingly, frustratingly, is continues to be there. Um, all that is necessary, but we also uh, have to make sure that you know we uh, ride on innovation because innovation offers the hope for a qualitative uh, jump forward and and difference. As long as three things are in place: one, of course, leadership; two, the money, funding; and three, that with innovation we reach the right people. Uh, there are now enough uh, papers of uh, uh, introducing, be it uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or uh, other uh, preventive measures that are fairly uh, successful on first sight, but we don't reach the people who need it most. Uh, we reach the people who come to health services, for example, but these are not necessarily the ones where the infections are. And, you know, so this is where we need to make sure that it's not only continuing this technological innovation and what is very exciting is, of course, it's like long acting therapy and probably also long acting uh, prevention like the uh, cabotegravir and uh, nilpivirin, uh, long acting injections. And I think we could go to something that like uh, with four injections a year, we can keep um, the virus under control, both in the body and perhaps also preventively. Um, female controlled um, prevention measures and uh, uh, one of our co-hosts, uh, Slim Abdul Karim and Koresh Abdul Karim, have been pioneers in this field. So that's one thing. Secondly, and in terms of this technological innovation, let's not forget that we need to continue to invest in vaccine development, despite uh, disappointing results, even recently with the Janssen HIV vaccine. Also, we need innovation in prevention. There have been, uh, you know, uh, good initiatives, uh, interesting, like in. Uh, you know, in, in Kenya, in KwaZulu-Natal, in some parts in, uh, you know, all over the world where more uh, precise data have been used to adapt prevention programs to the needs of people. And it's a combination of qualitative research, listening to what people have to say, working with the communities, but also have very sophisticated quantitative data from genomics to see how the transmission works to demographic data and so on. And then another innovation that we I think we need to use more is to go beyond the health sector. Innovation in communication, reaching people, um, you know, young people like the sugar, the MTV sugar programs, uh, which have been adapted now from Nigeria to Kenya to South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, India. Um, and that's as important as having the right messages. But thinking of who do we want to reach and what is going to be the, uh, you know, what do we want to achieve and what's the best medium. And here, um, you know, the final innovation, I think, is we talk a lot about, um, you know, societal enablers, structural interventions, but there, um, that has kind of disappeared from the agenda, including, of course, fighting discrimination and so on. But we need to think again outside our health box because it can make a difference as these uh, projections coming out of UNH report. Uh, demonstrate. Now, to end, um, what's the way forward? Where to go? Um, first of all, I mean, I think we need to rethink the narrative of uh, HIV AIDS. On the one hand, it's clear that it really disproportionately affects many discriminated and, um, you know, marginal populations. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, if we position uh, HIV as only an issue for the most marginalized and discriminated, um, you know, that's not only wrong epidemiologically, as I showed the, earlier on in many countries, but also um, it really, um, you know, is counterproductive because it will push AIDS to the margins. And uh, we can forget about leadership, uh, political leadership and funding and so on. So, but we need to rethink the narrative in times of COVID and beyond. Secondly, we need leadership that is unashamedly committed to AIDS and not trying to talk about other things all the time. No, this is about AIDS. It's still the first cause of death in Africa, for example. Um, and it's still killing 
every year, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand people. This is not a detail. Thirdly, we need to revitalize activism. Um, uh, when I go to some meetings and uh, on AIDS, I see I see the same people I used to see uh, 20 years ago. There's something wrong with that. Uh, and uh, making sure there is uh, activism as the beating heart of AIDS response. Fourth, the brilliant coalition that made such a big difference, for example, in South Africa, but also elsewhere. You know, we need to rethink the, where are the coalitions and how to do that. And that may be different from one country to another. Fifth is, you know, we need to rejuvenate the strategy adapted to the new realities on the ground, new funding realities, but also new demographic realities, and, uh, you know, and deploy these innovative tools that I mentioned. Six, maintain research, be it the genomic research to understand transmission to uh, new um, you know, vaccine and new tools. And finally, um, you know, it's delivery that, uh, you know, is going to make the huge difference. And that will require also thinking through operational synergies. We've been talking about combining TB and HIV for a long time. Makes good sense, but it's often not happening. Um, integrating or not in primary health care and systems, but making sure that we reach those who are in need. So to end, um, let's not forget one thing. And, and that is that um, AIDS has always been about politics. And we need to ask our question, who's in charge? Who's in charge in a country? Who's in charge in the community? Who can be held accountable? And uh, as uh, scientists, as public health experts, let's make sure that we also are you know, players in this political field, because that's how we will get the commitment, the resources, uh, the innovation, and of course, the communities on site. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this wonderful initiative, uh, bring together China and South Africa and Africa and the rest of the world, because that type of global solidarity is what is absolutely needed to defeat AIDS. Great talk there. I was really struck by um, the idea of bringing innovation, taking innovation and looking at taking the long term view of how that innovation is deployed. Um, so thank you very much to Peter Piot there. It's now um, a great honour to hand over to George Gao. George is a Director General of the Chinese Academy for Disease Control, Chinese Centre for Disease Control and Pre Prevention, and Vice President of the National Natural AIDS, uh, National sorry, the National Natural Science Foundation of China. Um, professor Gao is also a director and professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences Key Lab on Pathogenic Microbiology and Immunology. And uh, Professor Gao is now going to talk to us about HIV in China. Let's hear what Professor Gao has to say. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, whenever your time zone is. I'm very pleased to be here for this World AIDS Day webinar to present my talk on HIV in China. I'm the Director General of China CDC. So I'm going to talk in four uh, aspects about uh, the HIV in China, the situation and response and the epidemic at the moment in China and our progress for the response. And also I with uh, one slide to think about the challenges in China at the moment for the AIDS response. So AIDS is something special. To control, to get the AIDS down, definitely you need a strong political will and strong leadership. So in China, in general, we have a very strong leadership and the political will. You could have a president, Xi Jinping, our uh, premier, and uh, also our vice premier, uh, Mrs. Sun Chun Lan, our uh, premier, Li Keqiang, you know, they all, you know, uh, very actively participated in the activity. So 
This is why, you know, to get the AIDS under control, the government role is very, very important. So the government and the administrative department, they really play a very important role in China. So in the state council, we have a state council AIDS working committee, which was established in 2004 and consisted by the members from 34 ministries and 11 provinces, autonomous regions and municipal localities. And uh, they are responsible for developing the national policy guideline and action plan on the response. And they are also coordinating the nationwide crucial issues, mobilizing the coordinate administration and the social resources and the activities of the AIDS response. So it's very, very important to have this SCAWC. And more than 40 policy documents over AIDS response have already been issued already you can you know it's uh, related to legislation financing human resources public security education civil affairs etc and similar coordinating and mechanism have also been established in the ref uh, in uh, uh, the mechanism uh, in the provinces and prefecture and country level so you know this is very important for this political will of course you have tried to uh, get everybody actively involved. So public involvement is very, very important. So we have China AIDS Fund. So the AIDS Fund for non-government organizations, they you know, uh, donate a lot of um, funds to support for this, not only for the research, but also for the activities, you know, very actively involved inside China. So for that, I want to address a very important uh, role for the community level control. You know, I was invited by the Lancet Public Health uh, after, no, during the COVID-19. COVID we are still experiencing the COVID-19. So what's the major, you know, achievement or major base for China to achieve such a good uh, achievement to um, contain uh, the COVID-19? So in my opinion, the public health at the community level is the key. So I wrote something for the comment. If you have uses, you can go and read this comment in Lancet Public Health. Strengthening public health at the community level in China. So that's very, very important. So what's going on for the epidemic at the moment in China? So at the moment in China, sexual transmission drives the major HIV epidemic. You can see from this uh, figure, it's so clear. 97.45, you know, that's a big number. Um, you know, they are because of the MSM heterosexual transmission. So that's uh, getting important in China at the moment. And also, you have an imbalanced distribution of the HIV epidemic in different areas. Look at the regions. You can say in some regions in, um, in the West, in the southwest, you know, these are the, the most uh, um, serious region uh, there. You know, this is why we uh, we you know uh, put a lot of effort in that area. I we will address a little bit more further later. So the testing capacities in China, while we have an epidemic, the HIV and the AIDS is very serious in China. And uh, we are working very hard to get all the answer from science. You know, getting the answer from the science is very, very important. By increasing all these um, um, screening and confirmation laboratories in China, you look at this uh, figure, uh, both screening lab and confirmation lab, you know, the numbers of the lab in the whole um, country is increasing. So we almost covered everything at the moment. So this is why. In general, though, I will show you 1990, 1990s, we haven't covered um, all of them, but we are near there and very, uh, with a good numbers here. Of course, uh, active HIV screening um, in China and increasingly increased uh, very quickly. Look at all these numbers, these new meetings, and, uh, and also the percentage. You know, you are talking about roughly about 20%. You know, we covered for all this screening nationwide. That's a very good number. That's not an easy number you could get. So, you know, that's a very important part in China. For HIV, it's different from the 
any other acute uh, disease, including COVID-19 or a flu, you know, because they are, uh, it's a chroma, uh, chronic disease. So it's very difficult to find the virus. This is why the screening in the population is the key. And also, you know, this uh, social organizations, uh, non-government, social government, and, um, you know, they really help uh, for this, uh, all this uh, screening uh, of the HIV uh, testing, you know, because this is a China AIDS fund. They, with non-government organizations, they, you know, did all invest a lot of money here. So it's very, very important in China. Interventions, the, in the left side, you can see for, um, especially for the, the occurrence in the illegal drug user at the moment, you know, it's uh, getting much better at the moment. And uh, also for the MSM and uh, uh, all this new country, all this number, they decreased a lot, you know, for the last few years. Of course, for the antiviral uh, or antiretroviral therapy. So at the moment in China, we have, we are running a very, very active program here. You know, of course, in China, the usage of the ARV is very late, not, um, you know, very early. But after that, you can see at the moment, we covered as, as much as possible in China at the moment, especially, you know, for some of these uh, lower uh, CD4 cult, um, you know, individuals. So this is a, give you an example, you see dramatic increase for the antiretroviral therapy uh, between 2004 to 2020. Um, you see, this is the, the number is 1,000. You can, you can see, it's, you know, you, 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 you hold China. It's uh, for the last decade, it's increased a lot. That's, you know, right, plays a very, very important role. And uh, also, we, by using this um, antiviral uh, uh, coverage and viral suppression, you can see the rate. You look at this, it's almost a level off already here. So this is, you know, you general. It's, um, you know, we, in China, we achieve a lot. However, look at this 90, so-called 90, 90, 90 progress. We still have a little problem with the people living with HIV who know, and you know, uh, who has no idea. But in general, if we, all those HIV positive uh, uh, personnel are uh, recognized or you know, found, usually that this uh, coverage is relatively good in China. You're talking about 92%, uh, point nine, and also for the treatment, um, you are talking about ninety six. You know, you can see this is a very important for the five, first financial support, a second active involvement from the doctors, and third political will. Political will, I always think, is a uh, is the key for some disease control like AIDS. Of course, we need some new technology. In China, we also adopted the PREP. Um, by using PREP, we also try to use the internet intervention. By using so-called social vaccines, you know, to try to educate or try to get the people understood what the why have HIV, why HIV is here, and uh, you know, it's very important to have HIV self-testing. So now we have some self-testing kits in China. It's a popularly you know vendor machine, you know, you know. Um, in the vendor machine, you can really buy that kit. So this can show you this, you know, example with all these uh, uh, soft drinks. You can drive buy soft drinks there. You can have a self-testing kit there. So you can see the um, online uh, selling here. Uh, it's you know it's it's a good um, form at the moment in China. And also we are doing the HIV molecular testing network. So we try to collect as 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 many as possible, all the data, uh, especially for the antiviral, um, you know, mutations. So we have all this, uh, because this is also very important for the targeted intervention. And we also try to put um, the poverty eradication together with the HIV response action. So what we did, we did in Sichuan province, that's in the southwest of China, um, you know, for Liangshan, so there, we tried very hard, tried to get all, you know, all these uh, uh, measures to be there. Uh, especially, we, uh, you know, summarize our action, we call it the innovative one plus M plus N. One, 
you know, means the leadership, the political will. M means is the health staff or pro professionals to be actively involved. And N is the numerous volunteers in the villages and in the community level. You needed all these uh, volunteers to help us to set up all these, you know, uh, testings and also the treatment. And uh, if uh, this is a uh, during COVID nineteen, you know we also encountered the problem with the ART treatment. So we are ART uh, youth interaction during um, you know, COVID nineteen. Uh, you know we still you know we tried very hard, but uh, we also call everyone should um, really realize you know because of the lockdown, because of suppression and COVID nineteen, you know we you might have some problem with the um, epidemic of the AIDS and the treatment. Finally, this is the challenges ahead in China, in the world. First, no effective vaccines. It's not really in China. You know, that's a global problem in the whole world. We don't have an active, we don't have an effective vaccines. In my opinion, we need to keep asking the answer from science. We need to invest more in the basic science, whether you more in the basic research, maybe one day, we will understand well about the virus, understand well about the disease, and then we might be able to get an effective vaccine. Uh, and also we need something, you know, radically curative drugs. You need really you know, eradicate this virus. You know, that's our target. And second, sexual transmission dominates the epidemic at the moment in China. So we need, you know, really with a social vaccine, try to, to, to educate or try to get the public understand you know what's going on in the whole series of the HIV. But in general in China, we have a very steady uh, epidemic, relatively steady, you know, it's relatively controlled well. And also in China, we have MSM is uh, another serious problem at the moment. Um, like I you know I showed you earlier, 390s, we have the first problem for the 90s, not 90 there yet. So always you have a late diagnosis. That's very, you know, a serious problem. And for PREP in China, I mentioned it's just impl implemented. And it's, you know, initial state, we need to work harder to make sure, you know, we can get it done. So in general, so this is a challenge ahead uh, in China. Uh, I hope we can collaborate with you and get some good answers. So this is the World AIDS Day, what we need to do. So the slogan, let's work together and inequality and AIDS and pandemic. Now, since we are together here with South African colleagues, so I'm calling here by following the four C principles, let's work together. We need the cooperation. Meanwhile, we also need the competition because competition co co cooperation, they are twin brothers and twin sisters. They will help for the development of the science and technology. Let's work together. We also need to keep communication. We also need to do some coordination. So this is something I wrote with uh, John and Kangasaw uh, in Lancet uh, Global Health. So we call public health priorities for China-Africa cooperation. So we, uh, with John, we put these four C principles for the future collaboration. I hope we'll have a good collaboration with South African um, colleagues. Let's work together, get the A's down. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Gao. That was a that was a great overview of the situation in China. I was really struck by the the thought of having HIV self testing in vending machines. Um, which is a, a great innovation to improve accessibility. Um, I would remind everyone who's listening to the session today, who's, jo who's joining and enjoying the talks, please do uh, post your questions to our speakers in the live question bar um, on the platform today. And we will uh, have a session at the end where we can put your questions to the speakers and get live responses from them. Um, so we just uh, heard about the partnership between China and, and Sub-Saharan Africa there, and, uh, and Professor Gao mentioned our next speaker. Um, 
It's a delight to, uh, to introduce John and Kangasong, uh, whose work in HIV uh, is, uh, is and other infectious diseases led to his appointment as director of the African Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, um, which has been uh, in which he's done great work. And uh, and more recently, uh, John has been a special envoy to the WHO Director General on COVID nineteen preparedness and response. Uh, John is going to talk to us uh, now about HIV in Africa. So let's uh, let's hear what John has to say. Greetings from the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm extremely delighted to have been asked to contribute to the World Day in 2021 by uh, commenting or making a few remarks on the epidemiological trends of HIV in Africa. I will, in the next couple of minutes, go through the trends <clears throat> and look at the global trends of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and I, I use the word pandemic very deliberately and then focus more on what the trends we are seeing on the continent for the last couple of years. This is a busy slide, but it shows you three things. One is the number of people living with HIV AIDS cumulatively, which is about 37.7 uh, million people. The people that are newly infected with HIV AIDS, uh, HIV in 2020, which is about 1.5 uh, million people globally. And then the AIDS related deaths in 2020, which is about uh, 680,000. Uh, I will go into the details, as I said, with respect to the African region. If you now look at the continent, every day there are about 4,000 new HIV infections in adults and children in 2020. 60% are in sub Saharan Africa, 10% are amongst children under 15 years of age, 90% are amongst adults age 15 years and older, of whom 51% are amongst women, 51%. That is a disproportionate burden in, in, in women. 31% are among young people and 20% are among young women. If you now look at uh, the regional HIV AIDS statistics and future in 2020, you look at and compare a, a few regions, you look at the East Africa region. Let me first of all just explain what the colors are. The green colors are the adults and children living with HIV AIDS. The blue are adults and children newly infected with HIV. And the orange color are adults and children deaths due to AIDS. So if you now look at the region, the Eastern and Southern African region uh, has a, a, a disproportionate amount of people living with HIV AIDS, about 20 million. And then uh, the West and Central Africa, about 4.7 million. And in North, uh, Middle East and North Africa, at about 0 0.23 um, at, at million people. That's over 230,000 people. The number of adults, as you can see, it, and children estimated to be living with HIV-AIDS since 1990 to 2020, clearly uh, 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 here you see the adults and estimate. The, the light greens you see there are what you call the range of uncertainty, but clearly, of course, uh, how the cumulative number has increased as you can uh, just uh, it can be rightly justified because of people are living longer because they are on HIV AIDS uh, treatment which has been scaled up and I'm sure we'll discuss this in the subsequent slides. This slide shows you the, the number of adults and children estimated to be living with HIV AIDS in 2020. Uh, first of all on the left hand side it shows you the map of the world with an estimated 37.7 million people living with HIV AIDS with a confidence interval of 30 million to about 45 million. And it clearly shows you the disproportionate uh, uh, impact of HIV AIDS in, in Africa, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. On your right hand side, it shows you the people living with HIV AIDS by region uh, between 1990 and 2020. And uh, it is remarkable that the orange line you see up there is Southern Africa and is really uh, uh, distinguished in terms of the impact, the disproportionate uh, volume or uh, uh, number of people living with uh, HIV in, in that region. If you look at the number of adults and children newly infected with HIV between 1990 and 2020, 
you clearly see that it has been steadily uh, 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 decreasing, but we are not where, yet where we, we have to be. That is decreasing between 1990 and 2020. Again, the thick uh, uh, green color shows you uh, the um, adults and children newly infected with HIV AIDS, and the light color is the range of uncertainty. This slide shows you the estimated number of adults and children newly infected with HIV AIDS in, in 2020. But I would like to focus more on the right-hand side, which clearly shows that the efforts that are going on across uh, the Africa, different regions of Africa, is, uh, is, is Spain. Uh, you can see the, the, the orange color, which is the Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, how the numbers have decreased uh, steadily. But in other regions like Western Africa and Central Africa, the decline has not been as remarkable as in other parts of, of Africa. And this is again, uh, just to show you in uh, the, the picture of adults and children, uh, the child deaths due to HIV AIDS between 1990 and, and 2000. It's remarkable that in 2005, that is where ARV have been scaled up in Africa and it started showing an impact. And you can truly see the correlation between that scale up. We started around the early 2000s, and then the way the curve started bending, coming down uh, nicely, showing the, the impact of an intervention, an effective intervention in managing uh, an, an HIV or an endemic disease. This graph then shows you the different regions comparing the estimated number of uh, adults and child deaths from AIDS in 2020. I mean, again, it mirrors the previous slides, dramatic uh, decreases in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, uh, but really uh, uh, kind of stabilizing the decline in, East, uh, in West Africa and Central Africa is not as profound as you see in uh, the Eastern and, and, and Southern Africa. Now let's look at the 40 years history of the AIDS response, characterized by remarkable discoveries. <clears throat> in 1981, as we know, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported uh, the first cases of, of, of HIV. And in 1980, as you can see there, uh, it, 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 HIV was characterized and defined. And then in 1987, the first therapy for AIDS, the Zydovidin, was approved by the US. Fast forward in 1984, uh, 1988, very important uh, uh, clinical trials showed that we can reduce or we could reduce mother to child transmission. And then in the year 2000 or so, you, the African Union member states 2001 uh, committed to allocating at least 15% of annual budgets to improve the health sector. In 2002, the Global Fund to Fight HIV AIDS and Malaria was created. And um, in 2002, also about 300,000 in developing countries in treatment I mean, started seeing the impact there. But fast forward, you can see where the, the, in the whole spectrum over the last 40 years, the response has changed. And clearly we are now at a point where who could have imagined that in 2020, about 27 million people would be on HIV treatment. And now we have a new global AIDS strategy with focus on ending inequalities to end HIV, uh, HIV AIDS uh, ep uh, epidemic. That strategy has been adopted by the United um, uh, Nation AIDS uh, program. This slide shows you uh, amongst people living with HIV, the percentage who know their, their HIV uh, positivity status, receiving treatment and are virally suppressed. And you can see on your left hand side uh, that about 84% uh, of people who knows their status, about 73% uh, of people who, are, uh, who knows their status are actually receiving treatment and 66% of people who are, uh, have been diagnosed and on, on treatment have viral suppression. The viral suppression, this is data from the UNAIDS in 2021. And on the, the, the right hand side, it shows uh, women and men, you compare that number, the same breakdown of the total population by gender. You clearly see that uh, 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 the, the, the the bar with women that is um, tend to do better than men across the board, whether you're dealing with people who know their status or those who are receiving treatment or those who uh, have, have virus suppression. That is an area, clear area of work. Whereas, yes, the burden is in women, but we see that unless and until 
we uh, are very specific and focused on the men's issues as well. Uh, we'll continue to have that gap and in, in, in inequality in uh, treatment, uh, viral suppression, and knowing their status. This slide shows you ART coverage by region and uh, very clearly um, uh, uh, the, 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 the eastern and southern region uh, uh, clearly showed a, a, a remarkable progress. Uh, Western region and uh, uh, Central Africa region, they show 61% and 68%. That is where a lot of work needs to be done in those two areas. I'm very pleased that just uh, two weeks ago in Dakar, Senegal, UNAID actually convened a meeting to look into uh, the details and a, a deep dive of what the situation is in, in those two regions. Uh, this slide, I will not go into the details, it just breaks down the ART coverage by, cent by different regions. I will leave you to, to, to digest that, but it's just unpacking what has happened in the different regions between 1990 and, and 2020. So ending the uh, HIV AIDS pandemic by 2030 will require that, of course, um, we look into key fast track targets and, and, and how do we inf uh, enforce the 1990-90, which uh, truly has been uh, revolutionary in the way in which we address the HIV pandemic and how do we uh, sustain this and address those gaps that I showed in the previous uh, slides. This is for an example of countries reaching the 1990-90 HIV uh, treatment target uh, in 2020. Um, clearly in, 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 in green are those who reach uh, 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 only uh, those who reach the 1990 targets. And then in light green are those that reach only the 73% uh, the, the viral load suppression. And then um, in, of course, uh, uh, orange color are those that have not reached the 1990 uh, targets there. Again, the uh, idea here is not to um, uh, shame a country, but rather to raise awareness. For example, countries like Eswatini uh, that have just uh, are green all across the board. Uh, Rwanda is doing uh, great, except in the areas that um, uh, in children uh, that that so this kind of a graph and projection is designed to encourage countries and partners to focus on where the, the burden of the disease and where we are struggling in order to support countries to get to where they, they have to be. So the global uh, AIDS uh, program, uh, UN AIDS has launched uh, the the N inequalities N AIDS global AIDS strategy, which the Africa CDC is totally adhered to, adherence to. It talks about a zero discrimination, zero new HIV infections, and zero AIDS related deaths. And that is the way that we should be uh, uh, targeting to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. And there are cross cutting things that must be looked at, covered in this uh, strategy. They include strong leadership, country ownership and advocacy, partnership, multi sectorality data science and research and very importantly inno innovation stigmatization discrimination human rights and gender issues and then the city urbanization and human settlements are all factors that will play a role in in the way we reach uh, that target by the year 2030. this is also a slide that shows you how uh, a pandemic can impact um it, uh, hiv response very clearly and uh, uh, how the percentage change in number of people receiving ART compared to baseline in January, February of 2020 has been uh, disrupted by the COVID-19. We need to factor that into our response, the emerging and re-emerging infections. Uh, this is uh, the, the COVID-19 disruption in HIV services, percentage change in number of, of tests uh, across um, different countries in Africa. And let me just, as I move to conclusion, also just point us to the, the, the threat that the global HIV drug resistance pose on our ability to reach our targets. And we also have to keep an eye on and a focus on the drug resistant issues that especially amongst uh, naive patients in, in the world. This slide shows you the progress in transition uh, to the, the DTG as a preferred ART regimen in low and middle income countries. And um, I think clearly uh, a preferred first line regimen among adults and adolescents in low and middle income countries. We continue to believe that new innovation will enable us to come out with new drugs and new approaches that will in, uh, facilitate uh, delivery. 
So again, as I conclude, let me just leave you with three key messages. AIDS has come a long way since the first cases about 40 years ago, in that a uniformly fatal disease has been transformed into a chronic manageable condition through global solidarity, through uh, programs like the Global Fund, PEPFAD, and other global solidarity mechanisms. HIV is a, remains a global challenge where each one of us needs to take responsibility for reducing the spread of the virus. And uh, uh, that we must achieve ARV uh, uh, coverage in the world and ensure that uh, uh, we reduce gaps in inequalities and, and inequities. That is the only way we are going to together achieve our goal. I thank you so much for again, including Africa CDC as part of this very important um, uh, celebration. Uh, that is the World AIDS Day in 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John, for that great overview of uh, HIV AIDS in, in Africa. Um, I think it was striking how, you know, you, you mentioned about the, you know, the steady decreases in HIV metrics, but things really aren't moving as fast as we would like. Um, so thank you, John. And uh, again, between speaks, I'd just like to remind you to keep questions coming in through the uh, live Q&A box on the platform. Um, and we'll look forward to asking your putting your questions to the panel later. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce you uh, to Sibongile Shabalala. Um, Sibongile is a national chairperson of the Treatment Action Campaign for South Africa, a board member of the Rural Health Advocacy Project, and a member of the Global Fund Country Coordinating Mechanism for South Africa. Sibongile is going to talk to us now about HIV challenges in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's hear what uh, Sibongile has to say on that. I'm Sibongile Chabalala, the National Chairperson of Treatment Action Campaign. I'm going to talk about the challenges in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as South Africans, we know that since uh, COVID-19 has come, it has affected everybody's lives, not only South Africans, but everyone in the world. And we know that no one was prepared to deal with the issue of COVID. It has just came and without any uh, preparations to governments, to civil society, to communities. Uh, we started to see uh, COVID-19 in 2020. And when we saw COVID, uh, it has come in a time when we're dealing with lot of challenges uh, in our countries. I will be specific talking about what was happening in South Africa. We know that in South Africa, we have not, uh, about more than, eight, more than 7 million people who are living with HIV. And out of that 7, eight, seven million uh, people who are living with HIV, we only have 4 million people on treatment. And when COVID strikes, we're still looking at how are we a, a, a initiating more people on, on, on ARVs. But COVID came and took all the attention from the HIV fight, from the other fights that we already have in the country. So what we have seen happening, it's when we say we saw people uh, 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 dying of COVID, but also those who are living with HIV felt neglected. Why I'm saying this? We know that many facilities, when we uh, were in under lockdown level and uh, level five in, in the country, many facilities were, were, were affected by COVID where one staff member or two staff members are infected with COVID. And when they were infected with COVID, that means that the facility needs to be closed. And when the facility clo is closed, that means patients are unable to access their treatment. But most, uh, uh, a thing that was challenging is that there was no communication to patients to say, today Clinic X is closed and patients who need medication, they can be taken to another facility or they can collect their medication from, to the, from the other facility, which it made more people to default on treatment. And also as a, as, as a country, uh, as much as our government was saying, they are ready to deal with COVID, but they were never ready to make sure that 
we maintain the standard of, of initiating people to treatment, of making sure that those who are on treatment are staying on treatment. We have written letters to the government to say, you need to make sure that at least people have to, from three to six months treatment so that people cannot be, uh, cannot default from treatment because of uh, not having enough treatment. But that didn't happen, which it made it difficult for mostly people who live living with HIV, which at the end of the year in 2020, we have seen about 20,000 20, people that we have lost in treatment uh, in the country, which is very problematic and which I think it has taken us back as, 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 as countries. But also a uh, commitment from the government in fighting a, 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 a HIV. That is still also problematic because we have seen less funding coming to fight a, a HIV and everybody now is focusing on COVID, which it's not wrong, but we shouldn't forget the problems that we have a, as countries or the, the, the challenge of HIV. Remember, HIV is still killing people in the country, in, in the world. And as I'm talking to you here now, we have more than 1,000 young girls, especially in the African countries in South Africa, who are infected with COVID every week. What does that mean? It means the fight against HIV is not yet over. And what we're saying to say we want to see you to end AIDS by 2030, it means we are taking 10 step back now. We are getting more people who are who are living with HIV and at the end of the day there are no services that and uh, they, they they must that that are, are, are focusing on them or there is less commitment from the Department of Health from the governments or from the funders uh, uh, who needs to to support uh, people on the ground we have we've been talking about inequality and inequality has been affecting mostly people on the ground. As people living with HIV, we have been seeing this for decades. Remember now we have we are 40 years uh, having HIV and we, we've been dealing with this uh, uh, pandemic of HIV for 40 years. But up to today, we are still talking about inequality. We are still talking about people who cannot access treatment just because they are living in rural areas. They we are still talking about people who cannot access treatment because they can't afford to, to buy treatment. We know that other countries like South Africa, we had organizations like TAC who fought for treatment and made sure that the government it, 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 it provides a medication to people. But at the end of the day, we still see inequality because when you go to facility and you are you are unable to buy your medication, then you have to wake up at 4 a.m. to queue for the for medication that you will get at 11 if the earliest, and sometimes you get it after two just for medication. But the person who's living with HIV, who can afford, who has medical aid or can be able to pay for their health, they don't even have to go to the facility. The medication is either they go and collect it from the pharmacy or from the doctor, and it's even delivered on their house, so which it makes it easier for the person who can afford than the person who cannot afford. But also, if you look at how countries are responding to, to, to HIV, you find out that those rich countries are able to respond better than those countries that are unable to afford or who are low-income countries. We have seen countries like South Africa, as much we have a high uh, number of people who, who are on ARVs, but I'm still talking about half of the of the people who are living with HIV who are still on treatment. So that is inequality that I'm talking about. But also the communication, the the way HIV is still treated. People who are living with HIV are still stigmatized. When you go to the facility, your card is still a, a, a written, or it's, you are still given another card with an, another color than others, uh, other people who are living with other chronic diseases. So when we are talking about issues of stigma, discrimination is still the problem. And those issues, as much as we have tried to address them, but I think we have not, we have not yet uh, 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 dealt, with, dealt, dealt with those issues as we are supposed to. So what we are saying as people living with HIV is 
we are heading to a well aid day is that HIV fight is not yet over. We still have to fight. There is still lots that needs to happen. We are still facing the issues of stock out. We are still uh, facing issues of people living with HIV who are denied treatment. We are still facing a challenge where people living with HIV, they don't have information. And also we are still feeling uh, dis discriminated and stigmatized because of our statuses. So that is the message that I want to send to all people living with HIV to say, we still have to fight. We still have to uh, uh, take uh, the burden and move forward because the, uh, the fight against HIV and AIDS, it's not yet over. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sibon Gile. Um, that was an incredibly passionate, passionate speech there. And uh, really, um, you know, you really hammered home how those messages which have you, people have been making since the start of HIV are still so important today um, and highlighting why this session on end inequalities, end AIDS, end pandemics uh, today for World AIDS Day is such an important session. Um, well now uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Um, an infectious diseases epidemiologist, uh, director of Caprice uh, and uh, Caprice Professor of Global Health at Columbia University, New York. Professor Kareem is also a member of the uh, African Task Force for Coronavirus. And certainly I'm sure um, a lot of us will have seen uh, Salim uh, on various outlets and news stories over the past few months uh, speaking about coronavirus. And uh, it's very reassuring, I think, always to know that Salim is uh, working on coronavirus um, and it, yeah great pleasure to introduce Salim who's going to speak to you today about COVID-19 um, and how COVID-19 has made HIV control even more critical and mapping the path forward. Let's see what Karim has to say. Good day. It's my great pleasure to share with you today in preparation for World AIDS Day, COVID-19, which has made HIV control more critical, just to give you some perspectives on mapping a path forward. What I hope to do is to deal with some of the key challenges that we face in HIV today, the limitations and the centrality of treatment, HIV prevention, dealing with COVID-19 before talking about some ideas on a path forward. So let's look at the pandemic today. If we're looking at HIV, in 2020, worldwide, there were 38 million people living with HIV, almost 700,000 deaths and one and a half million new infections. Africa accounts for about 70% of the world's HIV, with Sub-Saharan Africa, about one out of four infections occur in young women. Pro Professor John Nkengosong has touched on many of these and he's given you a clearer sense of the challenges we face right here in Africa. Globally, we have almost 4,000 new infections of HIV each and every day. And overall, our global strategy is built on treatment for prevention or TASP, treatment as prevention, as it's widely known, with the 2020 targets of trying to achieve 90, 90, 90. So let's look at how we've done on those targets. Well, not too badly. We have achieved 84, 87 and 91 at a global level. That's the current estimates from UNAIDS. We were supposed in 2020 to have achieved 73% of all people living with HIV being virally suppressed. We are now at about 7% below that. We are about 10% off that target with 66% of people living with HIV thought to be virally suppressed. So we've had good global progress. It doesn't mean great. We haven't exceeded our target or hit our target, but we are pretty close. 14 countries have achieved the overall target of 90, 90, 90, and we've seen some uneven progress. In fact, in North Africa, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, and in Central Asia, we've seen much lower levels uh, of overall viral suppression 
at 36% in North Africa and 50% in Eastern Europe. And we've got still a way to go to get to the target of 73% in those regions. But we are heading in that direction and we are using new technologies to help us there. We have now new drugs with better safety profiles, we have simplified regimens and we are moving uh, towards a long-acting injectable approach. And we hope that these new technologies will help us get even further in that direction. Let's touch now on the limitations of treatment as prevention in terms of community impact. Ruben Granich and colleagues at the WHO showed many years ago in The Lancet that if you model the impact of treatment, you could end the HIV epidemic. However, when we look at individualized actual treatment studies in HPT and 052, we saw a wonderful impact. We saw how at an individual level, if you treat somebody, you reduced the risk that they can spread this disease. However, when you translate that into universal test and treatment trials, we've seen more challenging evidence in that we've seen little impact on HIV incidence. And as we've looked at these four trials that were undertaken in Africa, looking at how trying to roll out treatment and what impact it has on prevention, we've come to understand that antiretroviral treatment is no silver bullet. Its scale-up is essential, but not sufficient for epidemic control. And so we need to go beyond treatment as prevention. And we can see that here, that as a global, at a global level, we have been doing quite well with good progress on treatment. You've seen that in terms of our achievement of 66% on the way to the 73% target. But we are lagging in prevention. We've seen how from 2015 to 2020, over those five years, we moved from 1.9 million new infections to 1.5 million new infections well above the target we had originally set of half a million in new infections only. We have quite a way to go to achieve our targets. And so how are we going to get there? Well, let's talk about those challenges in HIV prevention. At a global level, outside of Africa, we have seen key populations being central to the new infections. On the right-hand side, you can see how new infections in Eastern Europe and Central Asia have been increasing. And so we see that. We see that in the Ukraine, in Russia. We see that new infections continue at a pretty high rate in key populations, such as men who have sex with men and injecting drug users. But in Africa, what we're seeing is a general population challenge, especially in young women. So let's look at this challenge of HIV infection in Africa. You've already heard from Dr. Nkenga Song the real problems we're facing. And the high rates of HIV infection in young women remains a challenge to the global pandemic. We're never going to achieve HIV control unless we can change that trajectory. Data published in several studies recently, we've seen in The Lancet and other journals, have been showing that there's been a steady decline in new infections in Africa. But one group has remained refractive. We have not seen those declines in young women in several countries in Africa. And to give you just some idea of that burden, on the right-hand side, look at the orange bars. That when you're looking at young girls in this large community-based study, a representative study of the community and HIV prevalence in the community, already by age 15, 6% of young women have HIV. And when you go to age 30, the prevalence is all the way up to 70% in a representative sample. So giving you some idea of the sheer burden of HIV, particularly in women and high rates in young women, being central to that. So what are we hoping that we will be able to use to turn that around? Well, pre-exposure prophylaxis. We have seen how PrEP 
has been steadily increasing across the globe, particularly in Africa, driven by the DREAMS programs and country, prog country programs that have been introducing PrEP. We've seen the benefits of PrEP, and here I'll use the example of PrEP in men who have sex with men in San Francisco, well, a dramatic impact. We've seen a 43% decline in new diagnoses in three years. However, the sad tale of PrEP in Africa has been somewhat different. What we have seen is the first early adopters of PrEP in Africa have largely been serodiscordant couples. That makes sense. These are individuals who recognize their risk. But even in that group, we have seen difficulty in sustaining PrEP. And so we have been seeing high fall-off rates from PrEP even in serodiscordant couples. Unfortunately, we are not seeing adequate uptake from young women. And the issue is very simple. In order to take PrEP, you firstly have to recognize that you are at risk of HIV. You then have to recognize that the PrEP is something that would benefit you in addressing that risk. And then, of course, you've actually got to go to the clinics, have access, be able to get there and get the, the, the medication for PrEP. Those three requirements are onerous, especially the first, that for young women who don't see themselves at risk of HIV, PrEP will be a real challenge in getting high coverage in that group. And so we're going to have to think about this differently. We've got to think about a new paradigm for PrEP. PrEP needs to shift from a user-initiated approach and provision. And we've got to move to a whole new strategy of a provider-initiated service, where PrEP becomes the norm for communities at high risk. Just think back initially in PMTCT, how low uptake we had for HIV testing in pregnant women until we shifted it, until we shifted it from a provider-initiated testing approach to a, 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 a user-initiated testing approach to a provider-initiated, where it became the norm that when you walked in and you were pregnant, you were going to get an HIV test and you were going to get PMTCT medication if necessary. We have to shift our thinking about PrEP along those lines. And we're going to need new technologies to do that. We're not going to be able to have provider-initiated approaches if we have to see people on a monthly basis or three-monthly basis. We have to move towards technologies that will last at least six months, if not a year. And, but we've seen improvements. We've seen how we've, we've got safer alternatives for daily oral prep. We're now seeing monthly injectables and two-monthly injectables. We're seeing uh, a monthly ring, possibly even going up to three months. But what we need are longer acting technologies. And thankfully, many of them are currently under study. We ourselves are looking at a six-month approach with broadly neutralizing antibodies. There are others looking at different approaches. So, how are we going to look at this? How are we going to look at HIV control in the midst of COVID-19? Well, three key challenges. The first is attention for HIV is declining. In this global survey, the number one challenge that people around the world were seeing in 2020 was the coronavirus. It eclipsed unemployment, poverty, uh, political corruption, all of those. So COVID-19 has taken center stage. HIV has been shifted to being in the sidebar. We've also seen how COVID-19 and its impact has impacted HIV services. We've seen here in South Africa, in papers we've published in Science and in Lancet HIV, we've shown how HIV testing was compromised, but all of those impacts were short-lived. And we've seen how we've been able to recover and antiretroviral treatment has now gone ahead. We've seen how in severely immunocompromised HIV patients that new variants are being created. In this particular example, this individual developed several mutations in the spike protein, and three in particular were the same mutations that we see in the beta variant. 
So new variants are going to continue to arise from immunocompromised individuals. Individuals included in those are not just transplant and cancer patients, but a severely immunocompromised HIV patients. So we've chosen our path. We've chosen a path that involves using treatment as the foundation for our overall approach. And we are now going to need to see how are we going to move the next level. Getting to 90, 90, 90 and 95, 95, 95 simply gets us to base camp. We still have a long way to go to get to the summit and we're going to need to be flexible. We're going to need to deal with these challenges with new benefits. And a successful climb to the summit is going to need at least these five key ingredients. Translating new science into community impact through knowing your uh, epidemic, knowing your response, targeting it as you see in this picture from KwaZulu-Natal. Community engagement, addressing inequalities as part and parcel of our approach, doing things with people, not on people. But we're going to have to have committed leadership. We've been fortunate in some parts, sometimes during this pandemic, that we've seen that kind of committed leadership. And we know the importance of global solidarity. But we're going to need a bold, evidence-based plan to move us beyond our treatment targets. And that bold plan has to be a global response that I'm simply going to refer to here as TASP+. Plus. It's going to go beyond just treatment as prevention. With three underlying principles, dressing vulnerable individuals, leaving no one behind, an evidence-based set of strategies, and effective implementation, especially targeting priority areas. And the three key components of this plan is a recommitment to ensuring we continue the rollout of treatment, but we need to move beyond our targets of 95, 95, 95. We're going to have to go concertedly on a provider-initiated PrEP program, and we're going to have to bring a combination prevention tools as we are needed in each setting. This HIV prevention toolbox will have two key tools, treatment, PrEP. But it's going to have to build all of the other tools that we have. We know that are effective. So building on ART and provider-initiated PrEP, we're going to have to maximize the benefits of combination prevention. That we have to be bolder in thinking about how we're going to tackle HIV in the upcoming years to achieve the UN target of 2020 of uh, controlling HIV and ending AIDS as a public health threat so that it remains just an endemic infection. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Karim. Uh, thank you for that excellent speech to round off our presentations today. Um, I've been really struck throughout all the talks by um, by some of the themes that have been that I've seen emerging through the talks, such as how far we've come with HIV, the wonderful advances in science, and the tools that we have available to us today. But really, getting back to the theme of today's uh, today's session about ending inequalities the need to get those tools to where they're really needed um, is key to advancing the fight against HIV and AIDS. Now, um, throughout the talks, people have been sending in, have been submitting questions. People can, I believe, continue to submit questions during this, during this uh, moderated discussion. Um, so please do use the live question bar. Um, but I think we can now uh, perhaps start with some of the questions that we've got for you. Um, I'll start with a question for Peter Pios, if that's okay. Um, so in your presentation, Peter, you underscored the importance of leadership dedicated to HIV and AIDS. Could you please elaborate on that and why dedicated leadership is still key? Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you to all the presenters. I really learned a lot and I couldn't agree more with, uh, um, you know, with Slim in the last uh, presentation that we we need to go where the people are and uh, we uh, we need this kind of new strategy building also on what Adiba said of the 
uh, you know, um, based on science, but innovation will come. And so uh, that means that the toolbox may become more efficient uh, because from prep, from daily prep to four times a year, who knows? Um, so lead leadership, why am I insisting on that? Because uh, for a few uh, reasons, one, um, take just the, the, the last presentation and what uh, Slim said, in order to implement that, um, you need um, yeah, leadership to make sure that uh, it's not only official policy, but that it's at all, all levels, there is accountability. Um, you know, as we also uh, heard, you know, from the community, um, that there is money. Without funding, um, you know, you can't do these things. Um, and sometimes, you know, you need uh, to take unpopular decisions. And I think Adiba's point about harm reduction is a point in case, uh, case in point, that um, uh, this requires leadership that may go against popular uh, sentiment, um, but it's uh, evidence-based. Um, and we've seen that in the past, and that's where I'm quite worried that, uh, um, you know, uh, it is of the yeah, political agenda, but it's not only political leadership, there's scientific leadership, technical, community, and at all levels. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and then I suppose one to follow on from that, um, if uh, I could ask George Gao, because you also mentioned leadership in your, in your presentation. Um, you shared with us the amazing progress that China has made in response to AIDS and the importance of accountability and leadership at every level of government. If you had the opportunity to speak to leadership in Africa, what advice would you give on ensuring that even as we deal with uh, COVID-19, um, how do they not drop their focus on HIV and other key diseases for the region such as tuberculosis? Thank you. I think um, you have already seen recently we have the new virus, new variant of the COVID-19, uh, the Omicron. So at the moment, all the scientists and public health workers thought it might be arriving from a you know, HIV population because it circulated, I think Dr. Karen will give a you know, more clear uh, a view about that, but in my opinion, you know, um, because of the, that, uh, and the, you give a chance for the virus to mutate. So, so this is why the community level capacity building is very, very important. Um, I said in my um, slide, uh, I want to add a little bit more for Peter's uh, a point about the political will or leadership. You know, in, in China, political will or leadership, they, they encourage to invest a lot in the community level uh, for the capacity building in China. You are right. I traveled to many countries in Africa. So I found the community level facility or capacity is a problem there. So, and even, you know, you, when you are talking about anything, even in the developed country like in Europe, where Peter lives, or in America. So previously, you have very good community level um, capacity because you are a kind of a developed country and you forget for the public health, the community level is very important. For example, I remember, do remember from the very beginning, even in some countries like in uh, Ireland and even the UK, the community level nurses are not there. So because we have the SARS, we experienced the SARS for the last decade, we spent a lot of money for the community level uh, building up the capacity. So in my opinion, the lack of the community level uh, capacity for the public health, that is in both the developed countries and the developing country, including Africa. And the developed country, because they never thought they have the problem with the uh, uh, disease like, and the public health problem like the COVID-19. So they ignored the community level diagnosis, you know, including the, for example, nuclear acid um, the test at the moment. In China, you, we can't do that just because we experienced the SARS decade ago. Otherwise, we also have the problem so this is why I want to address more. Again, 
First, political will, leadership, focus on more uh, community level base. And second, you invest your money in the community level, not in the central level. Thank you. That's my comment. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I think sort of it would be nice following on from that, since you've just been talking about the community, um, if we could bring in uh, Sibongile um, to talk about, because obviously leadership isn't just uh, governmental leadership, but leadership also comes from comes from the community. And I wonder, Sibongile, if you've got any reflections on, on leadership and uh, the role of community. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, as as everybody says that the community uh, uh, leadership is very important. We we should learn from what was happening in South Africa in the early days, around 1998 to 2004. It took communities uh, to take leadership to fight the government of South Africa to be able to initiate people on on ARVs. So that is is a lesson to say as communities we know best we know what is happening in our community and the, as much as south africa has a high a biggest rollout on, on arvs it took leadership from the community to to give information to communities to simplify the science of hiv and also to be able to understand what is happening in the community and how to address issues of hiv in the community Community leadership is very important and we shouldn't ignore it because at the end of the day, we are seeing more problems because people on the ground, we know best what is happening and we know best how to respond to these issues because we are living in community. We uh, engage with communities every day. So we are we are very important role and that is what is very important. But lastly, uh, uh, Peter, I just want to say we also need a political leadership from the ground because what is happening mostly in South Africa. You won't see what councillors being uh, in the forefront of HIV, your, your, your premiers, uh, your your, your, your mayors are not in the forefront of, of, of HIV. We see less of commitment from that political leadership. So when we are talking about community leadership or leadership, we are meaning at all levels from the community side and the government side. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Sibongile. I think that really tied that subject up nicely and brought it back to the original question to George. So um, I think we might move on now to some of the more uh, sort of scientific or clinical aspects, I guess. Um, so a question here for um, Adiba. Um, you very eloquently captured the centrality of science in enhancing our response to HIV and at SARS-CoV-2. Um, including uh, new scientific advances um, and how they're involved in prevention and treatment. And you identified rightly the challenges of implementation. What are your thoughts on equitable access to some of the new innovations um, so that these expanding options become real choices for the populations who need them most? Thank you very much, Peter. Well, I'll just start off with, um, you know, uh, in terms of access to the COVID vaccine. Now the world is learning how painfully how, you know, the inequities in vaccine rollout um, is affecting the entire world. But going back to HIV, um, you know, the the um, the inequities there it can be in within countries, but also um, globally in terms of uh, access to, to these tools. Um, HIV has traditionally affected people um, at the margins. And um, unfortunately, I think in terms of government priorities uh, in, in financial investment, especially with domestic funds, um, people, people who inject drugs, uh, MSM, um, and you know, sex workers and transgenders may not be high on the priority list of governments uh, in investing uh, health dollars. So, and certainly we see that happening um, in, in many parts of the world. Um, and, and hence, I think, you know, despite us having all these tools uh, at our disposal, uh, we're still struggling to get them to where it's most needed, um, as, as Peter Piot. Um, very nicely put. So, um, you know, we, we've 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 
been living through this for the last what, two decades. We have uh, great tools and yet um, uh, it's not going in, in, in many places to where it's most needed uh, because of this um, inequities. Uh, underpinning all that is, of course, stigma and discrimination, criminalization of uh, behaviors um, that has plagued the HIV response for many years. Right. Thank you. Um, and now let's uh, let's come to uh, Slim, if we may. Um, so you mentioned in your talk about provider-initiated PrEP as part of the TASP Plus approach. Can you perhaps elaborate on what that is and, and what that entails at a practical level? Yeah, thanks very much, Peter. I think as we reflect on what is a new and important tool, that is becoming available for HIV prevention, we have to grapple with the next step, which is what's the best way to use that tool? Well, you know, in, the, in a very traditional medical model, the way in which we'll deal with that would be to simply, you know, invite people to say, you know, here's a new prevention mechanism, you know, come and get it, it's available at the clinics and we do promotion of this with information. I think if we take that approach that we will see PrEP simply become a niche prevention product. It will only be attractive to those individuals who will take it up because they see themselves at immediate risk. As we're seeing in Africa, in the bulk of the first batch of uptake, it's in zero discordant couples. So to change that, we've got to take that out of a medicalized setting, and we've got to look at it at a more uh, community-based setting. So let me give you an example. In the community in which I outlined, I showed you what the HIV prevalence is in that community. You saw that at age 30, you know, about 70% of women are already positive. In that kind of community, you've got a large part of the population already on treatment. Well, the remainder who are at risk of HIV, they should be on PrEP. And one of the key populations to get to, one of the key groups that need PrEP is young women. So if we had a six monthly or annual technology, what we could be doing is going with a mobile service from school to school to school. And when we get to school, we would consent, um, uh, invite all of the, the girls within the risky age range from 15 to 24, 15, above 15, and they are offered PrEP. It's a pretty standard, it's driven by the provider. And that approach would mean we'd have a large number of young women covered very quickly and we'd be able to sustain that because they don't have to remember in six months' time to take another injection right? because the mobile is back to give the next dose. So I think at a practical level in high-risk communities that we could make a big dent to the number of new infections through this kind of approach. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and actually, this, uh, again, I'll follow on with you, Slim, here, actually, and then maybe come to uh, other people on the panel. How do you think that sort of expanding options for pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, how, how, can they, uh, how can those choices um, be, be targeted at the people who remain most at risk? Do they provide new opportunities? Oh, Slim, you're on mute. I'll just touch on that issue. I think uh, my colleagues in, uh, uh, in George and uh, Sibongile will have good perspectives as well. But I think as we think about uh, a technology like PrEP, high coverage is essential for benefit. It's like vaccines. To get the real benefits and the full benefits of vaccines, you've got to get to high coverage. And PrEP is exactly that. Unfortunately, one technology is not going to suit everyone. So the more options we have, the more we have a chance of increasing coverage. 
In other words, we get, you know, horses for courses because individuals who prefer a tablet can take it, people who prefer an injection can take it, and so on. So I think that's where it will make a big difference. And, okay, uh, so Peter, you have something to say yes. about that? Yes, thank you. No, I, I think this is a really important uh, discussion and where we move from a, um, a let's say, a, a theoretical uh, centered um, concept to one that's uh, about people, you know, and, but the first point is that you need to know where your epidemic is and where transmission is. And that's where some of the really uh, the beautiful work done in, uh, you know, by Caprisa, but also in China, in several places in in, in, in Kenya, for example, uh, that's a, if you don't know, really, uh, and, and, and by knowing, I, I don't mean just assuming, but you have to document it because sometimes we're wrong and uh, uh, in our assumptions. So, and that's what, you know, you have, we have the tools now with, uh, you know, pretty sophisticated uh, genomic sequencing and so on, plus working with people in the community because they know uh, sometimes you don't need that sequencing because if you just talk to people, but yet it should be really together. And then that's the next step is then, and then it, and I'm not talking about years, eh? this is something that can be done um, rapidly and should have been done quite a while ago in any case. But then organizing um, your, the offer in, in function of that. If it's young women, okay, you think through where are people going? One of the reasons I mentioned like sugar is that, you know, we've been hammering young people with messages about don't do this, don't do that and so on. But you need to use the media the what they their role models there what appeals to them and then thirdly i think uh, uh, slim's point about options is really important you know what think of contraception is the same thing you know it's not just one uh, approach for family planning but you need to see to have options for in function of people's realities and uh, and these realities are different from one person to another so these are some of it but it's really uh, it hit my brain about, um, uh, you know, prep, offering PrEP in health services. You can have high, very high, uh, you know, take up, but it's irrelevant. I'm not saying irrelevant, but it's not going to have much of an impact on the epidemic. And Slim, you recently wrote an, uh, an, an, an op-ed on that, uh, you know, a comment. And, um, and that's where um, we need to, another argument to, to combine this, this, the basic science, or the and and uh, working with people in the community that combination can be really powerful if we translate it into service provision and go where the issue is it's the same for for vaccination eh? uh, you know uh, we're stuck the easy part is uh, you know the beginning and then what they call the last mile is usually a last a thousand miles with lots of uh, problems. And that's what we are, I mean, it's nothing new. It's just to um, use common sense. Um, thank you. Yeah, last mile is, is the hardest, isn't it? Um, Sivon Gile, I wonder then, since we were talking about sort of community engagement and communication, if you have any thoughts about uh, about how we get new innovations, be it prep or whatever, to, to the community. Um, <clears throat> Peter, I think, the mistake that we, we are making now, uh, all of us scientists, governments and, and activists, it's not, talk, it's not asking, especially when we talk to young people and when we uh, send these messages, messages to young people, we don't involve them in the first uh, planning and to understand what are they going through, what are the issues, how do we address these issues. I, I, I have listened to, uh, if you can look at the panel here, most of us, I, I, I believe that we are over 40, we are most experienced, but where are the young people? Because the young people, they know their challenges, they know what it's, uh, what is happening, and they have good in, uh, uh, innovative uh, ways of dealing with their issues. So what we need to do now, as all of us, as scientists, governments, activists, is to uh, get uh, uh, young people to be involved, not just to be part of us, but they need to be implementers, they need to be decision makers, they need to be initiators, and we need to listen to them. I think if we can get it there, I, I, I'm definitely sure that we will get somewhere. Great, thank you. 
And uh, with my eye on the time here, I wonder if uh, we could just come to Adiba and George in that order briefly to get their thoughts on this topic. Adiba. Yeah, I actually uh, had my hand up to uh, expand on what Chiwangli just said. I think uh, we scientists often forget to include um, the community in the original design of research, um, which can help us a long way in designing you know, research that matters in, you know, in, in, in designing research that will work. Um, for example, in the use of digital technology and innovations um, that sometimes, you know, are, are designed by computer scientists, let alone, you know, clinicians and, and end users uh, as well as communities. So I think to, to expand on what George said, one of the four uh, C's, uh, collaboration and communication uh, are essential in um, designing science that matter and, and making sure that whatever tool uh, we come up with um, uh, are going to be effective right from the get-go. Great, thank you. And uh, George, did you have anything to add on, on this topic? No, no more comments from me. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I think we are coming towards the end of the session today. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions um, or if you've got other things that you would like to ask. We've, we've just run out of time, but I think that discussion there was, was interesting and it was nice to hear from everyone there. Um, so it's been a fantastic session. I've really enjoyed all the talks today and I think there have been some interesting themes that have connected everything. Um, I've just got a couple of more, more duties to do. Firstly, I'm going to hand over to Professor Menji Han, who is the director of the National Center for AIDS and STD Control and Prevention in China, who works on um, implementing a comprehensive HIV response as, um, as a re researcher for the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, Menji is going to sum up with some sort of concluding remarks. Menji. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm extremely uh, delighted to join the uh, webinars to commemorate uh, the World AIDS Day 2021. I'd like to uh, thank Professor Selim and Professor George Gao uh, for the initiation and the planning of this event. And it's their professional reputations and achievements that enable us to engage our other distinguished uh, scientists and activists uh, to join this webinars. I'm sure that the, all of us very much enjoy and uh, learn a lot uh, from knowledge and insights shared uh, during the webinars. In the past four decades, uh, since the first case was reported, there are more than 30 million people have lost uh, they are like to HIV-AIDS. So currently, it's 37.7 30, million people are suffer from the HIV-AIDS. And uh, our fight against the HIV-AIDS, we have invested enormous effort, the great wisdom, and uh, substantial financial resources. So through this, we have made a great achievement. And particularly in Africa, with the highest HIV burden in the world, this struggle has been extremely hard and bitter. It deserves our respect that the Africa has achieved remarkable outcomes in HIV AIDS and uh, with a significant decrease in the new infections and the mortalities. China is uh, the greatest uh, uh, population country in the world. The Chinese government uh, has uh, adhered to the principle of the people-centered and uh, the put the people and their lives first. The HIV AIDS response is one of the most important the items on the government agenda for which the enormous the resources and uh, are invested. Uh, so uh, has made a great achievement. And uh, you have learned from the uh, presentations by uh, uh, Professor George Gauss. 
And this year's the UN General Assembly reaffirmed the commitment towards ending the AIDS epidemic. It's uh, opened a new uh, chapters in fighting against HIV AIDS. The, however, the COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, jeopardizing our effort. The epidemic is still raging with the emergence of new variants and uh, tremendous challenges ahead of us. We have to continue our fight against both COVID-19 and HIV AIDS at the same time. And we need to draw from the lessons learned from the past and continue with our new commitment. Uh, some of the views I'd like to share with uh, all of you. And firstly, and put human life and health first and increase the investment. The live no people living with HIV AIDS and the people who are vulnerable to the HIV AIDS behind and ensure that everyone has equal access to the HIV AIDS services. The secondly, the make full use of the science and technology and translate into the science and technology to the community, the strengthen the scientific research and the innovations in the medications interventions to provide the strong support for our response. The thirdly, the strength and the unity and the cooperation. The we are a community with a shared destiny. We must unite and work together to strengthen the knowledge and share experience and the cooperation. It's just like uh, uh, we have done today. Uh, finally, and mobilize the full uh, participation of the, all societies with the communities and the public engagement to eliminate the stigma and the discrimination that people and the living with HIV AIDS or the people vulnerable to the HIV AIDS in the open experience. It's my belief that uh, as long as we adhere to global solidarity and uh, share the responsibility and ending in equality, ending AIDS and ending pandemic will be achieved as soon as possible. Thank you, thank you so much. I very much enjoy the webinars. Thank you, thank you, and so did I. Um, I Again, I'd like to reiterate my thanks to Caprisa and China CDC for organizing this and for inviting me to moderate uh, today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm now just going to hand over finally um, to um, Research Powerhouse and Associate Director of Caprisa, Karesha Abdul Karim. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Greetings, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, and everyone who's joined us in this amazing past two hours for such a stimulating, inspiring, provocative uh, webinar. And uh, it's my great uh, delight and pleasure to thank uh, the many people who've been involved uh, in, in ensuring this webinar happens, starting with the China CDC, the Chinese Embassy, uh, Caprisa, our wonderful moderator, Peter, our amazing speakers, um, all the way from starting off with Adiba, Peter, John Kengesong, Sibong Yile, uh, Slim, George, and, uh, and all of you for taking the time uh, to participate uh, in this webinar. The many technical staff who've worked behind the scenes from each of the organizations. And, and I just wanted to spend a minute on our speakers. Um, I think that uh, many of us are still reeling from Omicron and trying to, oh, we thought we're gonna have a nice quiet Christmas after two years. And, uh, and, and the thing that's striking is that each of our speakers is not only um, involved in HIV, but playing a pivotal role in COVID-19. And so they've each reminded us about the importance of solidarity. 
And we've seen how solidarity and global solidarity has enabled us to accomplish so much in an unprecedented way in HIV that our, uh, our accomplishments in COVID in a way has been facilitated by these investments <clears throat> in HIV, in TB, in Ebola, in coronaviruses in general. And so while we celebrate and remi remind ourselves uh, of great success and progress in the HIV response, we've also been very sharply reminded this is not an epidemic that's over and that we have to keep our eye on the ball and that we're going to face in this next um, decade or more many more pandemics and we cannot afford to drop the ball and have multiple incomplete pandemics or epidemics and how do we again join hands um, at every level to ensure not only um, that we put HIV, TB, and COVID behind us, or as Peter has reminded us, it may not be completely out of our life, but can we get it to levels of endemicity that enable us to normalize this in our lives? So thank you, stay safe, stay well, and uh, wish you the best over the holiday season as best as we can under the circumstances. Thank you so much.